All right, everybody. Well, uh, welcome to the real world where uh, things don't always go your way. Uh, yeah, that's me. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're in this business, if you are, you know, if you are building any kind of application in the cloud, frankly, not even in the cloud, and you're successful, you know that failure, you're going to inevitably encounter failure at some point. And in fact, the more successful you are and the more your scale grows, the more different kinds of failures that you're going to see. So now, my name is Becky Weiss. I am an engineer at AWS. I've worked here about six years on a number of our great services at AWS. And uh, you know, when I have the privilege of talking to the fantastic customers of AWS across virtually every industry, usually I talk to them about how to be successful using the cloud. You know, particularly in my current gig, I talk to them about how to successfully use our security controls in the cloud. Well, here I'm here to talk about something a little bit different. I'm here to talk about how to fail in the cloud. All right, so that's what we're going to talk about all here today. Um, this is kind of a conceptual talk. This is a little bit less of a sort of product talk. I will be talking about a couple AWS products that help you towards the end. But most of this is really about how we at AWS think about failing. And the way I've chosen to structure this talk is we're going to kind of go backwards in time through a failure. We're going to start with uh, after the failure. And I'm going to talk a little bit about AWS's post-mortem culture. Now, we didn't invent post-mortems. Many of you do post-mortems. But I'm going to focus on the aspects of it that we, in particular, obsess over so that we're not wasting our failures, so that we milk everything we can learn out of each of our failures. Then I'm going to take a step back in time and think about, um, well, maybe there's a way to spot yourself failing. You spot yourself kind of low-key failing before your customers see you failing. And if you think I'm going to talk about graphs, you're absolutely right. We're going to look at so many graphs. If you want to look at graphs, you have come to the right place. If you do not want to look at graphs, you might want to consider it. Um, and then finally, you know, we'll take a step back when you're building your applications. You know, what are some things you can look for in the AWS services you're using that might be able to give you a little bit of an assist in seeing yourself failing before your customers do? But let's start with the failure. Postmortems at AWS, like I said, we didn't invent the practice of doing a postmortem. Um, as a matter of fact, how many of you have some kind of postmortem in place where you work? It's like it's probably about three quarters of the room. I'm not surprised. Um, why do we do it? We probably do it for the same reason you do, um, is because it's an incredibly rich source of learning. We say at AWS, one of the strengths of our cloud is you know, we, were, you know, we were the first to the cloud. We've been in this business the longest, which means we have had the longest time to learn. And we are very careful about, you know, about how we kind of socialize our learnings. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Because the one thing I can tell you about, uh, about failures, like if you have an availability graph that looks like this, this means you're having a bad day. Right? Something about your service is having a bad day. Your failure is not at 100 where you want it to be. Um, and this is a fake graph. All my graphs are fake. I drew them all by hand. And I did that in so that you know, I could exaggerate the points I'm trying to make. But you know, it's a fake graph, so this didn't actually happen. But even if it did, I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about it without uh, other information. The only thing I can tell you about a graph like this, and I can say it with 100% certainty, is there's something you didn't know. right? If you didn't know that thing, you wouldn't have had a graph like that. There's something you didn't know. Time to learn it. OK, so how do we do this at AWS? We call our postmortems a correction of error, a COE. Um, you might have a cloud center of excellence COE. That is a very different COE than the kind of COE that we're talking about here. And um, you know, like many postmortem processes, it's a structured analysis of, of, of what went wrong. There are a number of ways in which it in which our COE reflects our peculiar culture, our way of thinking about our customers, and also our business priorities. I'm going to talk about that. But one thing that's important, um, a COE is often you know, a post-mortem at your business. You know, you, like you'll pro you, at, a, at a very basic level, you'll be like, OK, let's just prevent this from happening again. Right? That's probably why you're doing it. This process goes well beyond that, to ask a, a number of questions that we think are very important questions. 
We take these very, very seriously at Amazon. This is a COE that was written by the Lambda team. So Amazon is a culture of frugality, meaning that among other things that we don't have those fancy coffee machines in our office, we have an urn, and when somebody comes into work, uh, they make a they make coffee in the urn. One day, an engineer in Lambda comes into work and accidentally makes decaf coffee in the regular coffee pot. And you know what happens next, right? All kinds of impact. Um, so, you know, so they write a COE for this. And now I'm joking about this, but we do actually take these uh, very seriously. These are actually one of the most important parts of our operational culture. Uh, a lot of effort goes into writing these, and I'll talk about the different questions that you need to explore uh, when writing up one of these events. Um, a lot of effort goes into them. They get sent to a very wide distribution list around Amazon it, with that many people, myself included, will read all of them because in each and every one of these you learn something about how a service works and specifically how a service didn't work. Um, we, also, we also go over them in, you know, all together. Uh, we, on Wednesday mornings, we have an operational review meeting. All of the leaders of all AWS services are there. So I think hundreds of people, both in a room and dialed in from all the places around the globe where we build our services. The meeting is actively led and moderated by our senior vice president. And uh, for teams that have a COE that week, they present it to the whole room with open Q&A with the room. And this is us working really hard to make sure that every time one of these happenings, the learnings get spread far and wide. Now, you might think that I'm going to go into a discussion here of the cultural backdrop that makes successful postmortems necessary. Because you know there is a cultural, there is a cultural, a very strong cultural aspect to this. Exploring your failures is very much counter to human nature, to our DNA, right? Our lizard brains, like our lizard brains, when something goes wrong, the first instinct is to name, blame, and shame. Right? That's the first thing you think about. That's deeply ingrained in your brain. It's because the cavemen, when they went on an antelope hunt and it didn't go well because someone screwed up, they have to figure out who screwed up so they can kill them. Right? That's not how it works anymore, but your brain still works that way and you can't fix it. So you need some sort of structured process to counter that way of thinking. And this is ours. So we... Uh, but our culture is very much, you know, if you ever heard us talk about how we figure out what products to build and all that, we say we start from the customer and work backwards. That's how we do everything at AWS. 90% of our product roadmap is working backwards directly from what you have told us your gaps and needs are. Well, when something doesn't go our way, we do it exactly the same way. We start from the customer and work backwards because what happened vis-a-vis -vis our customers is the most important part of this event. So the COE template, we'll start with a summary, who, you know, newspaper like who, what, when, where, why, you know, because a lot of people are reading these and you want to give them an idea of what happened so they can figure out whether to keep reading. Um, but then the part we go into first, and well, we obsess over all parts of this, but this is a part that's particularly important. We're very specific and quantitative about customer impact. Matter of fact, if you don't have a graph to, that shows your impact, that itself is an action item that gets tracked as a result of the postmortem. Because the fact that you didn't have visibility into what, this is very rare by the way, usually there is, there are multiple graphs showing what was going on, but if there wasn't even visibility into it, that's kind of like the first thing that you need to fix is get visibility into this. So we have graphs, we also are very specific and clinical and quantitative about the customer impact. Who exactly was affected and how much, right? Was it the customers who use this feature who were affected, but the ones who didn't use that feature aren't? For example, how many customers? What were the common characteristics of the customers that were affected? And that's because, and that's because it's very important for us to assess the customer impact of this event so that we can assess the severity so we can figure out how serious an event this was and what to do about it. And you know, you'll see we're gonna talk a little bit later about blast radius, this gets into that question. But we put a great deal, and where we don't have visibility into the, the customer impact, again, that is something that gets tracked as an action item that we fix. Um, but then we go into the areas of focus here. And uh, there are a number of areas of focus here. I'm gonna go through them in turn. Um, obviously, there's root cause. Um, I'm sure all of you with postmortem processes do some kind of root cause analysis. Um, you might think that this is kind of the main part, that this is the crux. It's important, 
we put a lot of effort into it. The format that we use to explore root cause that I, I find being very effective, we didn't, you know, we didn't invent it. Probably many of you are using this, the Toyota Five Whys approach, where like a very annoying four-year-old, you keep asking why on, uh, until you get back to the thing that actually kicked it off. It's the, the, the root cause is not latency was degraded. The root cause is why that was the case. Um, so we do this, we get to the root cause, we fix the root cause, right? If there was a bug in software, of course that bug gets fixed and then you know, a unit test gets added and an integration test gets added and a canary test gets added to make it so that you would catch such a thing earlier. We definitely do these things. But I'm gonna tell you that that's actually, like in terms of spreading the learnings and in terms of actually building resilient systems, that's one part of it, it's an important part, it is definitely not the whole story. Because if you think about the kinds of failures that happen in the messy real world at scale, yeah, you had this bug, it caused a problem, and you fixed that bug, but you know what? There are probably a number of other sources of problems that you're not aware of yet that could happen, and the question is how do you get ahead of those? How do you, you're not gonna fix those ahead of time because you're not a psychic, you don't know what they are, but how do you limit the impact of those yet to be, unknown, yet to be known bugs, right? Because these yet to, be known, yet to be known bugs are gonna have some impact, and we have seen what happened when a bug hits this service, so maybe we can do something to make it go a little bit better next time. And so that's really the focus of this. Blast radius. How many customers were affected? Um, how wide did this problem spread? How well a job did we do of containing it? The question that we ask in our COE template is consider how blast radius could be reduced as a thought exercise, how could you cut it in half? This is an answer that everybody, this is an answer that everybody has to give if a service did not behave as expected. Well, because blast radius is very baked into all layers of what we do at AWS, if you learn anything about how our global infrastructure is built, um, AWS, 22 regions across the world, four on the way, more all the time. And uh, if, if you actually look at how that works, when you're talking to an AWS service, um, with the exception of just a few that only make sense if they're global, but if you're talking to, you know, just as an example, um, EC2, in, uh, in the Oregon region, and you're talking to EC2 in the Sydney region, the only thing these two EC2s have in common is that the same software is deployed to them. They share nothing else. And we do, and, and those, those walls of isolation, they go all the way up. In fact, if you're using the AWS console, you'll notice that when you switch regions, you're actually going to a different console endpoint. You're at a different service. We're very, very serious about this isolation because blast radius is a feature Blast radius containment is a feature of AWS, and because it's a feature of AWS, it's something we obsess over. It, it, it's a feature that we offer our customers, so we obsess over what the blast radius impact of any of our services are, any of our services when they get impaired. Um, you know, even below the region level, we have these availability zones. Again, they're designed to fail separately, and that is a feature that faces you, so you can build your high availability architectures on top of them. Deploy to them separately, they're separate power, separate networking, et cetera. We've got, in recent years, we've even gone beyond that one step is to, um, is uh, something called cellular architectures. We've got some talks here at reInvent about how we do that. And cellular architectures are a way to subdivide, you know, it's almost like little cookie cutter instances of our service with, you know, importantly contained scale but also contain blast radius. So a problem in one isn't going to affect the other. We're obsessed with this and wherever we see impact, we're always asking how do we, how do we contain similar problems in the future? Because we're gonna fix the problem, but we also want it contained. Now we also know that from the perspective of our customers, because again, we're starting from the customer working backwards, from the perspective of customers, the most important thing I think in one of these, uh, in, in, in when something isn't going our way, is that be as short as possible, right? When you think about it, there's, there's a very big difference between uh, an impairment that lasts a couple seconds and one that lasts much longer than that. If the impairment lasts a couple of seconds, just depending on what you're doing with that service, you may be papering over the whole thing with like retries that your SDK was doing for you. You may almost not notice at all, except to the extent that you'll have a few like weird data points in your graph. Whereas, um, you know, a longer impairment 
you know, we know has a greater impact on you, right? You may have to queue up work in the interim. You know, you may not be available to your customers in the interim. Um, this is very important and to us, to you, therefore it's very important to us and therefore we obsess over that as well. Now, we have a few very specific questions because we know that event duration is always so important. We have a few specific questions that we ask about that. Because if you break down an, an event duration, it actually starts with detecting the event. Until either a human or an automated process knows that there is a problem, the problem is probably not going to get fixed. So we ask ourselves, how could time to detection be improved? As a thought experiment, how would you have cut this time in half? And there's, you know, good time to detection and bad time to detection, right? Good time to detection might look something like this, where, in, uh, where a metric and an alarm caught it. And actually the best case scenario is where you have a metric that's really clean, that you have a really nice tight alarm, maybe on one data point, one one minute data point or two one minute data points, that as soon as you see a bad data point, the thing goes into alarm and either a human gets paged and or some sort of automatic remediation triggers. I'll talk about remediation a little bit later. But the good answer here is where the event got detected by automated processes quickly. That's the best case. Well, the best case scenario is not having impact, but the next best thing is be detecting it really quickly. Um, the bad case looks like this, where, um, where a human detects it. This is extraordinarily rare for us. And when it happens, it's, you know, this is a very serious item to get fixed. Um, but man, when humans are involved, they're so slow, right? Oh, I I'm see think I'm seeing a problem. And like, oh, can you repro it? I don't know. Like, maybe it's a problem with my stuff. Maybe it's a problem with your stuff. Tick, 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 tick. This is like really a worst case scenario. So in the very rare cases, it's something like that. This is, this is something that, you know, that, that absolutely needs to be fixed if time to detection is not automated and quick, automated and clean. Okay, but once there's... But once you've detected the event, the next thing you gotta do is mitigate it. Now I chose that word carefully. I did not say fix, I did not say solve, I did not say root cause, I said mitigate. Because again, we are obsessed with ending this event as quickly as possible. So, and we always ask, how could time to mitigation be cut in half, as, or reduced as a thought experiment, how would you have cut it in half? Now, if you think about what's kind of good and bad answers to this question, right? I'll give you an example. Deployments, when you're deploying new versions of your software, that's an inherently, even if you follow all the good practices of testing, it's an inherently risky activity. You're by definition, you're disrupting the status quo. You're changing something deliberately. And if you're changing something, the real world is messy. You might discover that it doesn't quite work the way you want it. And all of our and since we know that it's inherently risky, all of our deployment practices at AWS are very oriented towards rollback, right? When we deploy something, we have already tested the fact that it can be rolled back cleanly because that is the first bullet in our gun. Something's not going well, there's a deployment, it rolls back. In fact, our deployment tools have automatic rollback built right in. The way that works is, it deploys the software and it's automatically monitoring a set of alarms. If any of those alarms go into an alarm state, automatically rolls back to last known good, no human is involved. Sometimes the best case here, you know, and, so, and that will, you know, hopefully that will resolve the impact. The best case here is when the human operator who got paged by that nice clean metric, by the time they put on their glasses, it's already rolled back and mitigated. So where it doesn't look like that, we're looking to make it look like that. Um, and deployment is only one of many causes of, of impact. There are a number of other causes, but um, you know, we are looking for kind of these like self-healing, resilient, or, uh, uh, oriented services. And that is all in the name of reducing time to mitigation, taking an event like this and making it look like this. So, that's kind of, you know, there's more in our post-mortem template, more in, our, more in our COE process. We have action items that are tracked through a particular tool. They have deadlines on them. They have owners on them, because it's really important that all of these follow-up activities happen. So I'm not talking about everything that happens in the COE, but in terms of technical learnings that I think are 
broadly applicable. I think these are them. We're, we're obsessed with blast radius. So, you know, we're obsessed with being specific about customer impact and then reducing it. And then we're obsessed about being specific about the timeline of the event and exactly what happened when and how do we squash that. Because those are the things, you know, of course we fix the thing. But these are kind of the follow-on things that will make us better and better at failing in the future. Now, I should also mention, in our culture of sharing learnings about, uh, about failures, we also share a lot of learnings about wins. You know, this is, look at this graph, right? All these graphs are fake, but look at, these, look at this graph. This is the kind of graph that you come into work hoping to make, right? And I hope that someday in your career, you get to be responsible for a graph like this. And it's great. And when a team does this, it's usually the result of a lot of hard work and investigation and someone following their nose on something that they, you know, that, that they thought didn't look quite right. Uh, when we have one of those, we also present these at the Wednesday meeting with open discussion. And you know, the team will, you know, we, we don't have a specific template for this because it's a lot easier to talk about your victories than your defeats. But um, you know, the team will talk in quite a bit of detail about what they investigated, what they saw, what they fixed, and what everybody else should be looking for. Because maybe there's a learning that, every, that matters to a lot of other people. Maybe there's a lot of other teams who could get a graph like this based on what the responsible team learned. So this is all after the fact, right? Kind of want to not fail in the first place, right? If my service is showing signs of some kind of impending failure, I think I'd like to do something about that before my customers see it. I don't want to be marching off into the fog every day. So you know where I'm going with this, right? We're going to talk about instrumentation. We're going to talk about metrics. We're going to talk about how to, what to measure, how to look at your graphs. That's exactly what we're going to talk about here. Before I say that, I want to just kind of make a meta point that metrics are very interesting, and they, that itself can be a problem, right? Now, there is a wonderful ecosystem of various partners and software out there that you can use to do just absolutely an ever-growing set of amazing things with your metrics and monitoring output. Um, visualizations, artificial intelligence, all kinds of things you can do, and they're great. And the way you should choose a tool is you should choose a tool that your team is going to know how to use and use. But I'm not going to talk about something super fancy and high tech. I'm going to go kind of low tech here to talk about the kinds of things that you're measuring and what to make of them at a, at a really low level. Now, there's all kinds of really great things you can do with this sort of that are fancier. But we're going to keep it really simple here. Really, when I'm measuring a service, these are terms that, uh, these are my own terms. They're not uh, any sort of official terms of art. But when I think about metrics in my system, there's really kind of two kinds of metrics out there, health metrics and diagnostic metrics. Health metrics are saying, is this thing OK or is it not OK? They don't give me a lot of information beyond that. They're indicators. They're indicators. Ideally, they, I make them so that they're nice and clean indicators so that I can put alarms on them for my rollback alarms, for my health alarms, so that people can get paged quickly. Um, I'll typically be pretty conservative in defining them because I want them to be clean, but I'll want to have one for each measure, measurement that's important to you know, gauging the success of my business. Diagnostic metrics, on the other hand, I want zillions of these, because these are the metrics. This is me measuring everything. These are the things that's going to help me debug and troubleshoot a problem with my health metric. This is what's going to tell me why. Now, it's going to give me a fire hose of information and a ton to sift through, and I have to use my human brain to kind of navigate through and figure out which to look at. But man, I want information on all of these. So now. If I think about, you know, thinking about, we'll do kind of some examples here. So let's imagine, again, fake graphs here. Let's imagine I'm graphing the uh, number of 500 responses, internal, internal error. This always means that something unexpected happened in my service. One thing, do you think it's a health, or health metric or diagnostic metric? You can talk. It's a health metric, right? Because a 500 always means something went wrong. If I'm getting 500, something isn't right. You notice I have a few bad data points here, and probably want to go look into that. Now, 400 errors are uh, client errors. It means you know a client specified a bad parameter, like fat fingered an ID or something like that. Uh, got an access denied because they didn't actually have permission to do the thing they're trying to get. 429 throttled. They're too excited about my service. Um, do we think this is health or diagnostic? It's diagnostic, right? Because I, this metric isn't telling me whether I'm healthy or not healthy. It's giving me information. This is valuable information. 
But the shape of this graph is going to be driven very much by uh, what my customers are doing. Uh, uh, my customer, I might have a customer who keeps calling me and gets access denied because they're really sure that they should have access, but they're getting access denied. That would drive a shape like this. I'm not unhealthy. Things are fine. Now, a graph like this would be very hel helpful to me. Think about like when you might look at a, gra a diagnostic graph like this. I might look at a diagnostic graph like this if I wanted to see, you know, if, if it looked like my system was working really hard and not producing a lot of valuable output, well, it might be because they're spending a lot of cycles on producing people's 400 errors, for example. Maybe I could do something about that, maybe produce them a little more cheaply. To give you kind of an extreme example of a diagnostic metric, you know, if you ever use a relational database, you'll get to know the metrics that matter there. You'll want, like, really good metrics on that. Database transaction rollbacks. Uh, that's a really useful diagnostic metric because, for example, if I, uh, the rollback is what happens if somebody, if your application starts a transaction, nopes out in the middle because they hit an error or something like that, and they roll it back. They don't commit it because they don't want to commit it. Or if there's a, you know, there's a deadlock in your pattern of accessing the database. Either way, that means your database was doing work and you weren't getting anything out of it, which means that if your database, this, a graph with this shape might be a problem, might not be a problem, I don't know. The diagnostic graph doesn't tell me. But if a health metric is showing some kind of impairment, some kind of impairment of the database, maybe I'd go looking for this to see if uh, is my application driving a bunch of wasted work here. Let's do another one. Average latency. Raise your hand if you think it's a health metric. Raise your thing, hand if you think it's a diagnostic metric. Trick question. Don't do average latencies. We like percentiles. Why do we like percentiles? We like percentiles, well, actually, I just learned, I just recently learned like an actual real word for this. Uh, my daughter in high school is taking statistics. Uh, average is not resistant. It is not resistant to outliers. An average statistic doesn't give you information about anybody's experience, because the outlier can throw it way off. So what we do instead is percentiles. A 50th percentile will show you the median experience, half are slower, half are faster. Uh, we'll do a 99th percentile. That's kind of one of your slowest. And in fact, at, um, in fact, at, at our scale, we're doing 99.9, 99.99, because these percentiles are meaningful at our scale. So you want to pick a high percentile that's meaningful at the scale that you run. And these percentiles are telling me a lot more. Right? It's telling me the median, uh, the median latency here is pretty steady, but the slow one has some variability to it. Right? This is a much more useful number than that average. Okay, so graphs, graphs, graphs. We are all, we are all about our graphs at AWS. Every team, every service team at AWS has an operational dashboard full of the graphs telling them, it tell, you know, with that key health metrics that are you know, telling you whether the business is running, the service is successfully serving the business um, at the top. Um, important diagnostic metrics kind of below the fold, like you know, metrics on key dependencies and things like that that an you know, operator would often refer to. And uh, for all of our AWS services, these dashboards are up to date and can be explained, like, like any sort of anomalies on them could be explained at any time. Now, that's a pretty strong statement I just made. There are a triple digit number of AWS service teams. And I'm just, I just asserted that each and every one of them has a dashboard that's in good shape that they can speak to it at any given time, the drop of a hat. The reason we do this, the reason I can say that is because, again, operational practices. At our Wednesday meeting, we spin a wheel. We've actually open sourced the wheel. It's on GitHub. This is a screenshot of it uh, up on GitHub. You see that there's a, you know, here the example here has different kinds of fruit. Um, our wheel has a triple digit number of teeny tiny slices, one for each AWS service. We spin the wheel, and whoever comes up, a leader from that team, stands up in front of the room and presents the dashboard with an open discussion of it. And that means everybody's ready to do it every week. Now, when I talk about that practice to customers, they're sometimes a little bit taken aback. They're like, do you mean that you really go and like put someone on the spot just totally at random every single week? And the answer is yes. Because this is showing, these graphs, they show you what your service actually does. They show you how your service actually intersects with the reality of your customers. This is the most important thing we do. 
And yeah, so that's why we're going to get up and we're going to learn from each other in this room about our metrics. I would say that if you have the ability, if you're in a position at your organization to institute a, you know, institute a practice like that of having dashboards and making sure they're always understood and up to date, that's one of the best things you could do for yourself operationally. So we read these graphs, and uh, here, here, here in this talk, I, I think uh, let's have a little bit of fun with graphs. Uh, we're going to play a little sort of, I'll call it a metrics Rorschach test game, where I'm going to show you uh, fake graphs deliberately underlabeled. You know what a Rorschach test is from like old school psychiatry? They show an ink blot, and the person sees something menacing and scary, and they're like, okay, yeah, it's certifiable. Um, so. Uh, so I'm going to show you these graphs kind of as ink blots, and we're going to, we're going to kind of try to interpret them. We're going to see what we see here and what, what we would do if our service had a graph that looked like that. And, you know, the graphs are going to be a little bit exaggerated, again, to make a point. Okay. Um, volume graph, how many calls I'm getting. Um, and this is a time scale of about a week. Uh, a graph like this with a regular shape like this, pretty normal. Most of our services look like this. In our business, you know, the peaks will be in the afternoon on weekdays of, you know, whatever time zone the region is in. Um, you know, depending on what your business you're in, you might see this might graph look, might look a little bit differently. Like if you're in an entertainment business, Saturday and Sunday are probably bigger peaks than during the week. But, uh, you know, since many of our customers are enterprise customers, our graphs are going to look like this. Okay, this graph means, uh, this graph just means business as usual. Like this graph's fine. It tells me it's neither here nor there. All right, so let me overlay another, uh, another graph on this. This will be my P99.9 .9 latency. Um, and... Looking at this, I observed something. I observed that when, I'm, when the shop is busy, I'm getting a lot slower with my slower calls. You think for a second about what that implies. So that implies that there's some, that implies to me, when knowing nothing else, I would assume that there's some kind of contended resource in here, right? That when, the, when, when everybody shows up, because it's, it's 3 p.m. on a Wednesday, when everybody shows up, that resource, there must be some sort of line for that resource, some sort of weight or lock or something like that for that resource. Now, this might be bad news, because as my service grows, as my service grows, the shop's only going to get busier. And if I don't do something about this limit, it might really start to bite me. These numbers might be okay vis-a-vis -vis my customers, I don't know. Um, but uh, I might want to, I might want to look at, I might want to start looking at what that bottleneck is, because this is something that's waiting to fail. Maybe I'm okay today, but maybe I want to catch this fail impending failure before my customers do. Okay. Volume over a long time scale looks like this. Business success, right? You want your graph to look like, I have the privilege as an AWS engineer, I have the privilege of looking at graphs that actually do look like this. Okay, this is great news. All right, what if I take that same service and I graph something bad? Graph something where higher is worse. Now I can tell you some things about the shape of this graph that, that would have me kind of that would have me kind of worried about impending failure. First thing is the bad thing gets worse as my scale gets higher. Now I want my scale to get higher over time. There's something here that's not scaling well. And there's something here that's really not scaling well because as I get into the higher reaches of scale, you see it gets much jitterier, much less predictable. Now Hopefully, back then at the early part of the graph, you were doing your weekly, your weekly graph reviews. You noticed that something bad got higher. You know, how long it takes to cycle through all of your state as your state grows. If you don't do anything about that, you know, that number is just going to grow, degrade linearly. Um, yeah, you know, hopefully you would have done something about it before, but certainly now this is something that I probably pretty urgently look at. Okay, in case you're wondering whether all the graphs I'm going to show you are bad news, well, you're not too far off. Well, let's do a little bit of, let's do a little bit of good news here. Uh, I, I like this, right? P99 latency. First of all, it's nice and low jitter, right? It's, uh, so low jitter is good, nice and predictable. Uh, my alarm threshold, you know, where my customers are going to notice it if I get above that, um, it's well above my graph. I'm winning, right? So here's what I would do if you have a fantastic graph like this. First of all, congratulations. Second of all, let's keep it that way. Right? If you see a graph like this, 
Now, it is still true that my customers are expecting, you know, my customers are expecting me to be under this line, and I'm comfortably under this line. The reason why I move my alarm threshold down here is because I want to catch it if I get, if I, if, if anything changes, right? I'm nice and clean. Let's stay nice and clean down here. If somebody makes a deployment that pushes me above that alarm threshold, I actually want to know about it because something may have changed that wasn't in my favor. Okay, uh, do another one here. Um, chicken pox, obviously. Um, I guess nobody gets chicken pox anymore. Um, so, uh, okay, so these are failures. Let's say these are failures of a canary process. At Amazon, we test our services with something called canaries. I know the word canary means something else out in the world. Sometimes it can mean what we call a one box where you like deploy to you know, one host or one set of hosts before you deploy to the whole fleet. In our world, it means like a canary in a coal mine. For our services, we'll have a process that's running kind of in a loop, doing sort of what we expect a customer to be doing, just, you know, you know, just sort of as an automated thing and making sure that the results are what they would expect. So we have this canary. It's running, it runs on a periodic basis, and whenever it has a failure, it'll post a failure metric. Now, of course, I'm failing, I don't want to be failing, but ignore that for a second. Um, what do we have to say about a graph like this? Well, one thing about this graph is that it's sparse. Now, here's why we don't like sparse graphs. Because if my canary is not posting any failures, then one of, two cases, one of two things is the case. Either I'm winning, the canary's succeeding, or my canary can't even run, and that's you know, the worst situation of all. I can't tell the difference. So when you see a sparse metric, you know, encourage, your team to, um, encourage your team to fill it in, to post zero values. Um, you know, so the canary, if it posts a value of zero for failure when it succeeds and one for failure when it fails, now this is good, because if this graph, I can put an alarm on no data, because no data means my canary can't run, means I need to fix my canary at the very least. Um, so now I can tell the difference between good news and bad news. We'll do one last one here. Uh, latency. Um, okay, clearly latency went up for a while. I don't like that. Then it came back down. I guess that's okay. And you know, I'm looking at this graph. I'm trying to explain it. I'm like, oh, I know what happened. They were doing a deployment. Everything's fine, because when the deployment finished, it came back down. So everything's fine. Yeah, you know, it was a little above the alarm temporarily, but that's OK. You know, try to not have this, right? Because remember we talked about this before, that like a deployment is a period of inherent risk, because you're moving the cheese. Like something's going to be, something's going to shift with your service. If you have a situation like this where you know that the deployment degrades some metric that you care about, what's going to happen is people aren't going to put a rollback alarm on that. Because a rollback alarm on this means I could never deploy. right? It means it's really hard to tell the difference between when your deployment is business as usual, like, yeah, the deployment degraded something, business as usual, and when the deployment actually did something bad. Now, sometimes this is hard to fix, like if you have a bunch of state on your machines and then you're replacing the machines and they have to kind of reload their state. See what you can do here, maybe snapshots in the middle, something like that. See what you can do here to make your, make your metrics look great even across your deployments and that way you're perfectly clean and that way you can have those great rollback deployments to uh, reduce time to mitigation, make the mitigation automatic. All right. Well. In the last part of this talk, I want to do, this is not a product talk, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about uh, various kind of built-in features of AWS to help you start m measuring, monitoring, and failing like a boss. Because um, we do have, you know, we build our service, our services are designed for builders like you, and we know that part of building is the ability to monitor your systems and see them failing. So as you probably imagine, uh, as you might probably imagine, the key service here is CloudWatch. CloudWatch is our metrics, our alarms, our logs, our events. They all go through CloudWatch. Um, and CloudWatch has automatic integration. Like for many AWS services that you use, probably for most of them, you're going to be getting some CloudWatch metric out of the box. And this is the service kind of the, the design of the service. They're sort of anticipating what thing it is that you care about measuring from that service. 
So this is metrics on your key dependencies, the AWS services you use, as, as kind of some examples. Uh, if you're using Lambda, you'll get a graph just out of the box with you do nothing about how many invocations you had, how many failed invocations, successful invocations. Um, if you're using EC2, uh, for each EC2 instance you have, you'll get a couple of graphs out of the box. There's, there's actually a free set of metrics and a, and a detailed set of metrics you can pay more for. But the free set of metrics includes basic things like CPU utilization, network in, network out. Um, DynamoDB, well, DynamoDB there, the d dimension you care about is the throughput that you're using. That's kind of how DynamoDB is consumed. So you're going to get a metric on that. So the services will give you the metric for the thing that they know that you care about. And so these are metrics that you can include in your dashboard. We'll talk about building a dashboard in just a minute. Um, but the other thing you should know about CloudWatch, and I would say that if you are not doing this today, you should be doing this. You should get your logs into CloudWatch logs, your application logs. Um, this gives you, I'll show you some of the things you can do with that, but this, this gives you a central place to collect your logs to get visibility, and you don't have to like operate any machinery in order to centralize and aggregate your logs. Um, and the way you do that re is really very easy. I have, um, with uh, our serverless uh, our serverless services like a Lambda function or a Fargate ECS container, um, really getting logs into CloudWatch logs is as simple as writing to standard out. If you write to standard out, it just gets sent right into CloudWatch logs where you have all your logs centrally. Um, but even if you're running your application on EC2, uh, there's a CloudWatch logs agent that you can install on your EC2 instance. It's super easy to set up. You write a little config file, tells you where to find your logs, var log, whatever, and those logs get yeeted into CloudWatch logs. Now, in case you're wondering whether I used the word yeet correctly as a transitive verb, I did. I have teenage daughters. I think it's really cool when I use their words like that. So, um, okay, but you know, and even CloudWatch logs is something you could do even if you know, you're like, oh, I'm in a lockdown network. I don't have any access. You even have access to CloudWatch logs from within a private, VP, a private subnet of a VPC. You can use something called a VPC endpoint. Projects the service right into your VPC. What I'm saying here is that there is no excuse for not getting your logs into CloudWatch logs. Um, as a matter of fact, I love the week before reInvent. One of our recent announcements was you can even, so it's always, it's been true for quite a long time that you can configure something called a metric filter against your logs to turn your structured logs into metrics so you can take your application logs and just turn them right into graphs without you having to post metrics uh, deliberately. Um, but we, there's also an embedded metric format. Look up EMF where you can post log lines, uh, where you can post log lines that just get turned straight into metrics in CloudWatch. So we get better and better at helping you with this out of the box. So to finish up, I'm gonna do kind of a, um, let's call this a static demo because I am a little bit too familiar with failure to be doing a real demo with you here. Um, but I want to show demo uh, some of our serverless, um, a, a sort of fake serverless application and give you a little bit of, of a tour of some of the um, instrumentation and metrics and monitoring that I'm getting right out of the box with either no effort or an only very tiny amount of effort. So the thing that I've built here to sort of show off the capabilities here, this is a really simple fake service. It's a, it's a Lambda behind an API gateway. The API gateway has two, has a REST API with two resources, red and blue, a get method for each. The Lambda behind here does pretty much nothing except I've given it a way to induce failures so that I can make interesting graphs. That's pretty much it. Now the interesting thing part, part here is that, uh, you know, I'm deploying an infrastructure as code with cloud formation and in addition to deploying the application parts with CloudFormation, I'm also deploying all of my metrics and alarms with CloudFormation, including my dashboard. Now, this is an operational practice we have at AWS. Like I said, we obsess over the dashboards and metrics we have, and those metrics and those alarms, those are, we treat those as code. We put them under version control, we code review them because they are, they are a first class component of everything we build because we operate all of the things that we build, so we know how important these are. 
Okay, so I'm running, I, I build this application, I'm running it for a while, I'm having it induce some failures. And so, so let, me, uh, let me go right into CloudWatch. Uh, this is just the main CloudWatch console. And you'll notice already CloudWatch is helping me watch myself fail before my customers do because um, there is something in alarm here and it brings it right to the top. It's showing me you are probably here because you want to look at this. But I can also build a custom dashboard, and this is a, this is a custom dashboard that I start to put together for such an application. I'll show you a little bit about some, how I made some of these graphs. I made, there's very little effort involved in getting this dashboard here. And you notice there's some pretty useful information here just from the get-go, even before I start talking about like application-specific instrumentation and, and things like that that are specific to my business. But you know, the server list is uh, already doing a lot for me here. Um, you know, I've decided that I want a fault rate per API. I don't just want the raw number of faults. By fault, I mean a 500 error. So um, again, CloudWatch lets me do something called metric math so I can make a mathematical expression to show me this metric in exactly the form that I want to see it. Now, if you're wondering what all of this goo is here and you feel like you need to take a photo and then like, you know, try to like transcribe, don't worry about this. It, uh, to generate a CloudWatch dashboard uh, from code, the best way to do that, go into CloudWatch, create a dashboard by hand, you know, with the whole like, you know, pointy, clicky, draggy, droppy, and then go to view source and you'll see how this thing is specified and you can do that directly in your infrastructure as code. The dashboard is fully specified as JSON. So in case you're wondering, but you can kind of make out what's going on here. Um, of course, we document it too. Um, over here, uh, I've gotten API gateway per API, per method metrics, and I've done a little, you see there's mathematical expressions in here. You'll be able to recreate this on your own. Um, and how did I get those per method metrics? I wrote no code, I did almost nothing. The only thing I did that when I was defining my API stage, that's what API gateway calls like a production environment and a development environment. When I'm deploying my stage, I say in this stage, metrics enabled, true. That's my method settings. That's all I had to do. And then I can construct these great dashboards that are showing me my key health metrics. As a new feature of, uh, as a new feature of CloudWatch, a couple weeks ago, we launched anomaly detection. Well, you can see I'm generating synthetic load for my service. It's at an exactly constant rate. And I've created an anomaly band around it with CloudWatch. Now this thing's actually pretty smart. It's, it's smart enough to understand, like if I had that weekly pattern, it's smart enough to understand that. So this is taking my volume metric and actually turning it into something that could be a health metric, right? Because when I'm off my normal prediction band, it might mean something is unhealthy with my service. Like if I'm selling things and now I'm selling an unusually low number of things for a Sunday, there is probably something for somebody to look at right now. Or it could be the middle of the Super Bowl and people just aren't buying my thing anymore, right? It could mean, it could mean that as well. But these anomaly detections are very smart and they can, they can be made to alarm when you're outside the prediction band. So this is a new feature. I definitely encourage you to turn it on, particularly for things like your volume metrics, things that follow a curve and you wanna know when they're outside the normal curve. Because it means you could make a, you could, you could take that graph I showed you before that, you know, was kind of neither here nor there and turn it into an actionable health metric. Um, there's a lot of other things that you can, that, that we kind of enable for you right out of the box for operating and for being able to operate the service that you build doing very little work. Um, so, uh, you know, you notice down here, sort of below the fold, I start to build out my diagnostic metrics. I have error rates and by error, I mean 400 errors. And again, I have them per method. You saw how I did that before. And you notice my red API, and again, I'm inducing these errors. My, my red resource, my get red, is returning some errors. And I'm kind of curious, what, uh, curious what's causing that. I'd like to look into it. Um, okay, so I go into CloudWatch logs. Now again, I didn't write any logging code in my, I didn't write any logging code in my Lambda function at all. My Lambda function is really dumb. I think it just returns either 200 or 500 depending, or, or 500 depending on what it does. But I'm really curious about what this is. So I can use something called CloudWatch Logs Insights. This is a way to query your logs. And I'll explain in a second how the logs got there. But this is the, you know, the query here. We, you know, we document how to write these query language. You can kind of make out what I'm doing here. I'm interested in timestamp request ID. 
et cetera, a couple fields here for when the status, when the HTTP error code is between 400 and 500, so I'm looking for a client error. And I want to see the 20 most recent. Um, CloudWatch Logs is smart enough to discover the fields here. Again, I did not, I did not register any kind of a schema with them. And you can see here, uh, it'll show me a helpful graph of when I was getting these errors, and you'll see it'll also it'll show me my results. Uh, 429 is a throttle error. Uh, the way I induced this failure is I was making use of the great API gateway throttling function. Um, I have usage plans where I've decided exactly what quota of call rate each of my callers is going to get, and then I you know, yeeted twice as many uh, uh, volume against it. And um, how did I get all of that logging? Well, again, I didn't write any code. This is all happening for me out of the box to help me fail before my customers do. And this is really, I said, access logs. I want access log for this, uh, for this stage. And you know, I said what fields I care about to put into my access log. That's really it. Look at all of, the, this met, all of this richness of metrics and dashboards I have for really this kind of no-op service that I built. And you can do even better because you can be logging the things that you care about and getting those into CloudWatch and getting those picked up as metrics. OK, so we're kind of at the end here. Um, share one more failure with you. This is a failure of cake. It is, I actually did this. Um, this was a cake, birthday cake I tried to make for my daughter many years ago. And it, not very good at this. And, and uh, so when I took it out of the oven, it was kind of still liquid. I wasn't sure what you do with that, if you can put it back in or if that breaks some rule of baking. And so I, but I did take fifth grade science, so I knew that if you wanted to turn something liquid into solid, all you need to do is freeze it. So I put it right in the freezer, froze up nice and solid. But of course, what do you frost a frozen cake with? You frost it with ice cream. But the only ice cream I had was cookies and cream, and I could not be bothered to go to the store. Cookies and cream is a very disgusting looking ice cream when you put it on a cake. So I tried to fix that whole thing with rainbow sprinkles, and look what happened. My daughter still loves me. Um, OK, so what did I learn from this failure? Absolutely nothing. Still bad at this. But, you know, maybe I'm a better engineer than I am a mother. Because, you know, we at Amazon, <laughs> we at Amazon, uh, you know, we do, we take our failures and we mine them very carefully. We take our failures, we learn from them not only in a post-mortem process, again, which we didn't invent and we're not the only company to do, but we do have some specific technical learnings that we try to get out of them. And we try to carry those technical learnings back into how we measure our service and really having a, you know, again, like I said, the best thing you can do back home is to create a culture of having the right metrics and looking at the right metrics and being able to explain your metrics and being able to be a little bit pessimistic about these graphs that you're seeing and finding the things that you need to investigate and fix. And finally, um, you guys are builders in the cloud. AWS has a, has a growing set of features to help you get good at both succeeding and failing on us. So thank you very much for failing with me here today. I hope you have a successful rest of your reInvent. Have a nice replay tonight. <laughs>